I want to continue in this video talking about colonialism in Africa. So we talked about how there was initially um, contact along the coasts, but very little interest by Europeans into um, the continent of Africa itself. And that beginning to change with the Industrial Revolution. So by 1880s, the Europeans held the Berlin Conference. And at this conference, uh, 13 of the major powers within Europe basically took a map of Africa and drew lines on it to claim different possessions. Um, this was done with no African representation at the table whatsoever. And it really paid no attention to the cultures and societies and African states that existed on the ground. It was purely based on European power at the time and their quest for uh, resources there. If we look at this map, we can see what some of those possessions uh, were. In the green, we see French West Africa. Um, so you can see the majority of um, so the western part of Africa and along uh, that coast uh, became French possessions. Um, you can see British possessions in the pink, so South Africa, um, Rhodesia. You see British East Africa kind of along the Horn of Africa and parts of Somalia as well. Um, you see the Belgian possessions of the Congo Free State in the central part of Africa. Portuguese possessions in Angola and Mozambique. Um, so really, again, you know, taking total liberties to divide the continent. Oops, sorry about that. So as a result of these borders, you have um, groups of folks who had or, you know, worse societies, worse states were suddenly divided by these boundaries between the colonies. Places that were unified were then sort of torn apart by this division. There were also people that didn't like each other. Hostile groups, hostile societies were suddenly within the same boundaries of a country. And then in this part of the world, a lot of folks practice what's called transhumanists, where you tr basically move your um, animals from one part of the country to another um, to be able to take advantage of um, where the seasonal watering holes are, where seasonal um, foods available for them. So suddenly um, these migration routes were closed off because they were in what had become another colony or another country. By the time uh, countries became independent within the African continent, which is about 1950, you know, post-World War II, when Europe had lost it, a lot of its power and its ability to hold on to its colonies, the continent already had this legacy of political fragmentation, and the new African leadership at the time decided to hold on to most of those colonial imposed boundaries, which led to a number of problems. And I'm going to talk about some of those legacies of that colonial interaction. This map overlays those colonial holdings with the African societies that existed on the ground. So if you look closely at this map, you can see areas that have um, sort of a thin red line around them are places that had pre-existing African states in those areas. So you see quite a few states here. Um, some places that kind of stand out are places that you may have heard of in relation to uh, recent conflicts. So a big one is Darfur, which you see around um, the Anglo-Egyptian Sudan, and as obviously a, a point of genocide and conflict with just in with just within the last few years. If you also look around the area of, of Rwanda, you see 
an overlay of some of these pre-existing you know, multiple societies that have been thrown together um, when within state boundaries. So, you know, be aware of this in thinking about what conflicts you continue to see within Africa today. I want to talk a little bit about different strategies that European powers used to control their colonies in Africa. So Britain used a strategy of indirect rule and their colonies included Ghana, Nigeria, Kenya, and um, Zimbabwe. With this indirect rule, the British basically left the indigenous power structures in place. So these sort of local political structures were there and local rulers were then sort of made representatives of the crown. The British were still able to, you know, get access to the resources they needed, extract tax, all those sorts of things, but they left uh, those local leaders in place. What this meant is after independence, um, these countries fared a little bit better because they still had that indigenous power structure in place. For places that were French colonial holdings, uh, places like Senegal, Mali, the Ivory Coast, a lot of West Africa, the French took what could be called an assimilationist approach. So with this, the idea was to have a more direct rule which was enforced and also the propagation of uh, French culture, French language, French values, um, things like that. And you see that continued legacy of um, French culture. And also when we talked about Europe, we talked about um, ties of migration, folks coming from former colonial holdings back to um, the uh, metropole, those sort of crown of the, of the colony, colonial holdings. So you have a lot of folks coming from West Africa as migrants into France today because they have this uh, shared culture from that colonial history. Another form of direct rule that was much more authoritarian and gave you know, absolutely no voice to um, locals was practiced by uh, the Portuguese in their colonies like um, Angola and Mozambique. Um, this was a much more exploited, exploitative relationship in these places. Um, folks were enslaved um, and these colonies were held on to for a long time. Um, the main focus here was export-oriented resource extraction. So taking raw resources for um, industrialization uh, within Europe, and this was very rigidly controlled and used um, basically, again, enslaved labor in these places. Uh, Belgium was another example of this in their colonies in Rwanda, Zaire, Burundi. It was a very uh, paternalistic type of um, rule where Africans were basically treated um, as though they were children that needed to be tutored in Western ways, but there was no effort to try to make uh, folks Belgium, Belgian because there was this notion of um, inferiority that really infused a lot of um, Europeans' interaction. It kind of relates again to that notion of Orientalism that we heard about with Saeed. Um, then again, raw resource oriented extraction and totally ignored the development of local folks. So we can think about how these policies might leave different countries in better or worse situations upon independence. So places that had very exploitative relationships and no development whatsoever would have been much worse off than um, places that had left the indigenous power structure in place and had made some efforts towards development. And we see that in some of the uneven development that continues to exist in um, Africa today. I want to now talk about a few 
lasting legacies of colonialism. The first one is the reorientation of local economies. So as we stated before, you know, Africa wasn't a blank slate. There was all these pre-existing societies and states before European contact or before European colonialism. And what happened with really the onslaught of that colonialism is you have a change in the local modes of production. So rather than producing um, food for local consumption or trade, you have a change to uh, plantation style agriculture, large scale agriculture, growing the same thing with those things being sent out of the area. You also have uh, extraction of key minerals and precious metals. And we can really see that in the infrastructure that was built throughout Africa. Um, this map shows the railways in Sub-Saharan Africa. If you take a second look at it, what do you notice? Well, it's very interesting because we see that the railroads don't really connect to the various places in Africa to each other. They essentially connect um, in lines to the coast, especially, you know, if we look along um, the, the sort of uh, French controlled coast of Africa in Ghana, Benin, you see you know, these sort of individual lines radiating it, aiming out. And this has really left um, a legacy of difficulty in trying to transport goods within the continent itself because there's so much um, emphasis on export and that's how things were built. Though we'll read a little bit about that when we read about um, how development's happening today. Another legacy was the redistribution of wealth from Sub-Saharan Africa to Europe and other colonial countries. So that export of primary goods, you know, even those goods leaving, you know, people weren't making money of, off of that because everything was controlled by Europe. So Europe was making the money off of that and that wealth didn't accumulate to Africa. We can think about how his, that historic wealth that gets um, built up you know, enables people to develop in a lot of different ways. Um, so we can think about that as those countries become independent and, you know, basically have to start from scratch. Um, you also have, uh, with that, you know, switch of the economy to export, suddenly people aren't growing the you know, crops and the, the goods and creating the goods that they need locally. So you have a reliance on the import of key goods from other parts of the world. A third legacy of colonialism is destruction of historic land tenure systems. So land tenure is the way that um, land gets handed down um, through different cultures. So in places where you had white settlers like Zimbabwe, the best land was taken by the whites and converted into large-scale plantation and livestock ranches. So when these areas became independent and you have um, majority um, African populations, um, you have these white settlers who have the best land and really a lot of conflict and question about if that should continue, if land should be redistributed to uh, the black Africans that are living there, and how those sorts of things should be handled. And you see this as an ongoing issue in a lot of those countries that had um, white settlers. Uh, a fourth legacy is political imposition of boundaries. So again, you have those boundaries that were put in place by European powers. You have different ethnic groups that are split or put together and political conflicts that continue um, because of these. One of the more recent cases where you see um, a shift from those colonial boundaries is the new country that's formed uh, that's South Sudan. So 